Okay, so let's try and deal with that uh, rather severe noise issue. Um, what we're going to do then is keep our uh, least squares cost function here. This is like the data fidelity, if you like. But we're now going to add on a, a penalty. Um, you notice in that previous figure, what was happening in the direct inversion was that we were basically getting very large values that were completely swamping the rest of the reconstructed image. So what we're going to do here, here then is add on a penalty just based on uh, the size of the um, solution vector in the Fourier domain. So this just looks at the spectrum of the object, um, squares it. Um, so therefore, if we get very large values of f, this becomes a huge penalty term, which penalizes any f. Because obviously, remember, trying to minimize this expression. So the data fidelity will try and minimize this. But if minimizing that results in an f that's really large, then this term comes in and says, no, that's not a good minimum. In fact, so it won't be any more a minimum of this penalized least squares cost function or loss function or a projective function. So this, this kind of penalty term, we just look at the magnitude, um, the, the basic value squared of the solution. This kind of penalty is known as Tikhonov uh, regularization. There are various uh, formats for Tikhonov, but this is the most basic form. So we just followed the same procedure as before. We took the derivative, we won't go through that again, partial derivative uh, for the data fidelity component. But now we have this partial derivative as well of the penalty term, this regularization component here. So again, we just follow through the same kind of procedure. We would, um, the moment now we set that partial derivative to zero, at this point it's still a function of, of fn. This, this would be a 1D function at this point. Uh, remember, we're, we're just dealing with one of the parameters at a time. Um, if we set it to zero, the moment we do that, we now have to label uh, the f as the regularized least squares estimate because now it'll be the, we'll be solving this for f, and when we solve it for f, that will be um, you know, at the minimum, so at the regularized least squares estimate. So you can see here, this is pretty straightforward, um, just setting that equal to zero, I've just div divided by two, and um, I've also divided by uh, minus one. So that's removed that minus there and the two there. So that's g minus hf, g minus hf, but labeling it as the regularized least squares estimate divided by the minus two. So that's why that went and that went. And then this two goes and this swaps to a minus. Um, so lambda, by the way, is like a regularization parameter. So you would have come across that already uh, to some extent, but it controls how much of that penalty to pay attention to. And as you know, there are various strategies for picking that regularization parameter. Um, anyway, so um, yeah, so we've, we've taken the derivative of that. Uh, so that's why the two came down the front there and then we've divided it out here. Um, just working this through very basic uh, uh, rearranging of the equations here. I've just put the H in um, to inside this bracket here and then taken the GH over to that side, and that leaves me with um, this h squared, if you like, here, times the solution f plus um, uh, plus lambda times f. So that's um, all very straightforward. Um, so yeah, you can see I've also uh, negated both sides here, okay, because that h times the g, I've put it onto the other side, so it should be negative, but I've just effectively multiplied both sides by minus one as well. Okay, and then at the next stage, what I've done is just factor out f of rls. So just pull that out of the bracket there and then put the lambda in. And so that's how we end up with this expression. And then we can say the regularized least square solution is just by rearranging that. We just get hn gn divided by hn squared effectively plus lambda. Um, and then if you were to work with the complex case, you would need that description shown on the right-hand side there. Okay, so in fact, this is already a very interesting solution. Um, we'll, we'll look at what it's doing in a moment, but just to say this is like a very early warm-up to obviously the very well-known case of Tikhonov uh, regularization of um, a least squares problem for any matrix. But here we're seeing it for the special case of um, you know, solving courtesy of the convolution theorem, the diagonalization um, that the convolution affords us by, by use of the Fourier transform for convolution-based um, problems that we solve by deconvolution effectively. 
Okay, so that's the regularized solution. And uh, really then, as you can see, what's happened compared to the previous formulae, maybe this is the easier one to look at here, because you remember um, before it was just that expression there. And so we could say the same here as well. It was just this expression, and the H's just cancel immediately. Um, so previously, it was just G over H in effect. Um, but now we've got this plus lambda, and likewise here, there was the regular least square solution. Now we've got the plus lambda. What it will do is um, effectively inhibit small values of h star h. Okay, if this gets really small, imagine it even goes to zero. You know, in other words, implying there's no possibility of recovering the value uh, at that frequency index. Then this plus e, plus lambda comes to the rescue and actually stops a division by zero. So we can see it's going to have a good effect of of inhibiting large amplifications. It's going to stop uh, division by by very small values. Okay, um, so this just clarifies that further. So here's you know the one over h, if you like, effectively is shown by this um, one over modulation transfer function here. And um, I haven't plotted it here, but what would happen with this, with this plus lambda is that it would just kind of curtail that level of amplification. So it just uh, eases back instead of trying to recover every last high spatial frequency, um, it just drops that off and just eases it back. And so we get a smoother uh, solution, but hopefully one that now is at least visible compared to the extreme noise spikes that can happen in just a brute uh, direct inverse. Um, here I've just trivially rewritten it just to take out um, the spectrum G on the side here to show that really then what we've got, this is the Fourier transform of the back projected image and we're just multiplying it by a filter basically. And I've just commented on how lambda modifies the shape of that filter. So without lambda again it's going to look something like that dotted line, just a, a high pass filter of the of the frequency domain um, version of the back projected image um, to deliver the, the, the reconstructed image, which of course then has to be, sorry, the Fourier transform of the reconstructed image, which is why it needs to be inverse Fourier transform, of course, to get the original 3D object F. Um, but I'm just pointing out, um, we could also therefore resort to the kind of methods that might be used with filtered back projection. And in fact, it's also worth mentioning that the theory that we're covering here for this simple back project then filter algorithm a lot of it is very comparable to what goes on in the conventional filtered back projection because these are basically equivalent methods. One, you're filtering in the sinogram domain, and in the other case, you're filtering in the back projection domain. Um, so you're just kind of changing the order of the operations. So that's, again, why it's very educational to look at this simple BPF case. Um, so here what I've done here is just uh, rearrange it, again, just to show that that's the, if you like, the, 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 the core filter. And so in a filtered back projection context, that would be analogous to doing something like the ramp filter. Um, anyway, this is the high pass filter that, that basically is doing the inverse of the transfer function. But then we're showing we could use a windowing function to also deal with that excessive amplification of high spatial frequencies. And so I've just shown a classic uh, Hamming window, there's Hanning windows, and what they do is basically uh, they would have a, a spectrum that starts high and then just rolls off nice and smoothly and it just, instead of doing like a sharp cutoff, which could cause ringing artifacts, um, if you sharply cut off in the Fourier domain, instead of that it just gives a nice smooth roll off and it's another way of trying to regularize. So I'm just pointing that out that in fact there are many uh, available options for um, obviously for regularizing these kinds of inverse problems. Okay um, and just to show them what we get if we do that, uh, there's the original noise free case and now with the noisy case here, okay it's a pretty poor quality reconstruction but if you recall the kind of thing that we saw before you know, the object wasn't even visible. So by using, this is with a, a value of lambda equal to 10, again, it's gonna need tuning according to regularization selection strategies that you might have. But unfortunately, often at the moment, it's very empirical. Research methods are out there. You know already about the L-curve method, but there are rival methodologies um, still out there being published um, even recently on how to pick the regularization parameter. But as I say, often it comes down to um, something quite empirical and so that's certainly what I did here some time back when I did these very 
basic level reconstructions. And I just chose lambda equals 10. Uh, now at least the um, now at least the back projected um, the reconstruction of the back projected image is now visible. Okay, so um, now uh, just to finish this um, section, I just want to also look at a statistical motivation. Um, for the solutions that we've been looking at. So imagine now then those uh, real Fourier co coefficients um, had a, a Gaussian noise distribution. So we're saying that the Fourier transform um, of the back projected image, uh, so the spectrum G, we're saying it's normally distributed with a mean value given by what we've been talking about all along thanks to the convolution theorem where we have the, the, the unknown object spectrum F um, which is forward modeled just by multiplication by the transfer function. Okay, that is a model of the mean of the spectrum of the back projected data. Um, and then we're saying it's just parameterized by some variance as well. This is just the standard parameterization mean and variance of a normal distribution or Gaussian distribution. So let's use that as a model and see what happens. So now we're saying uh, the probability of getting um, a spectrum G, so remember G is the vector containing all of the Fourier domain coefficients for all the spatial frequencies of the back projected image. If the uh, true object spectrum was F, we're just going to model that as if they're all independent, uh, independent uh, variables, independent random variables. So therefore we're going to take the product of all the probabilities of getting um, this uh, Fourier domain uh, coefficient if the, um, if the parameter was f, because um, you know, it's the parameter f with h that models the mean. Okay? So the, we're just going to say, what is, the, what is the outcome of taking the product of all of these probabilities? Um, the reason for this is as follows, that we define something called the likelihood um, of the parameters, in other words, the likelihood of the object, because the object is basically the parameterized by that vector f, we talk about the likelihood of the parameters, the likelihood of the reconstruction, given the measured data. We define that as the product of all the probabilities. In other words, the probability of having obtained G as the, as the spectrum of the back projected image if the true spectrum was F. What was the probability of that occurring? And what we're going to do here is say, well, let's find the parameter vector F that maximizes the probability of having obtained um, the measured G, the spectrum G of the back projected image, uh, maximizes the probability of that given F. So what we're going to do here is we're going to, if you like, search around, try and find the parameter vector F, in other words, find the object spectrum F such that it maximizes the probability of having obtained um, the noisy data spectrum G, noisy back projected uh, spectrum G. And if we're using a normal distribution here, then just plugging in the standard uh, definition for a Gaussian, this is just the normalization constant that means the, the PDF sums up, integrates up to one. So that's just a standard definition. Um, and then the key point here is the argument of the exponential that defines the Gaussian. We have the noisy value um, minus the model of the mean. Remember the model of the mean was just courtesy of the convolution theorem here. And again, just the sigma underneath here is just the variance, which we will assume actually in this case it's just, it's just one. We won't make any modeling assumptions of the noise here. We will get to more advanced statistical models and reconstruction methods later on. But again, this is just a sort of preliminary building up of some of the methods. Um, okay, so this is the likelihood of any given spectrum F given uh, a measured spectrum G. It's just the definition, the product of those probabilities. Again, assuming that they're all independent. Okay, um, the next classic step to take here is to take the logarithm of the likelihood. Uh, the reason being there, were, there was an exponential floating around in that last expression, and that's not very convenient to deal with. So what we'll do is take the log likelihood because the log is a monotonically increasing function. So it will not change um, the particular 
uh, parameter vector f that will maximize that expression. It will be unchanged. It will be in the same position. So we can take the log um, with safety. Um, so that's the log of the constant term there. Obviously, that product of probabilities um, now goes to a summation just by basic rules of logarithms. Again, another great motivation for, for using logarithms. And then the, now, of course, that exponential term, when we log that, kills off the exponential term. And so we're just left with the argument for that exponential term from before. Okay, so that's just the log, the Gaussian log likelihood of the parameters given a measured data spectrum G. Um, just like we've done before, we just now take the partial derivative. The reason it's the partial derivative, of course, is that this is a whole vector of values here. And what we're going to do is just try and find one of the parameters and then apply the same, of course, for all of the parameters. So with respect to just one of the parameters, Fn, that's just going to be one of the um, frequency indices in that summation. Partial derivative of the log likelihood. Um, so the constant disappears. And obviously, n is just one of the, the terms in the summation. So we're only looking at one of the summations. Therefore, all the other terms in the summation disappear as constants with the partial derivative. So that's why we're just left with this one case here. That, as I said, disappears because it's a constant. So the 2 comes down the front here. And often you'll see with least squares objective functions, they often put a half in the front. And now we see with a Gaussian model, that half is implicitly already there. It doesn't need to be manipulated. So that 2 comes down the front, cancels it out. And again, that's why the half is often found there. Um, 2 comes down the front, it's gone. Uh, leaves us with Gn minus Hn Fn divided by sigma and then multiplied uh, by the der der derivative of the inside of the bracket just by the chain rule. And so the derivative with respect to Fn is just going to be the coefficient of Fn. So that's just um, minus Hn. And uh, yeah, well, we can see what we're going to get here, but it's just the principle, isn't it? We've done a Gaussian log likelihood approach now. Set to zero and solve. And the moment we've set it to zero and solved, um, that Fn now is labeled as the Gaussian maximum likelihood estimate of the spectrum of the true object. Okay, and I've, as you can see, I'm assuming um, standard deviation or variance is one. Um, therefore, the Gaussian maximum likelihood estimate is <laughs> rather unspectacular, but nonetheless interesting to see exactly the same formula that we found a couple of times before by the direct inversion, then just by regular least squares, and now by looking at uh, a Gaussian log likelihood and doing a maximum likelihood estimate. Of course, we've made all kinds of assumptions here, and we'll be improving upon those assumptions in later videos, but just bearing with it for now, um, it's just interesting to see that the Gaussian maximum likelihood estimate is given by exactly what we've been dealing with before. And of course, for the complex number case, you'd use this expression. But in a nutshell, this is um, Fourier transform with the back projected image divided by the Fourier transform with the transfer function gives you the spectrum of the object, which you then inverse Fourier transform. And here, of course, with no regularization, we've already seen we're going to get quite a bit of noise amplification, hence the need for the regularization of which we've already covered just a basic uh, Tikhonov regularization. So that's what I wanted to say uh, in this part of the lecture. Um, in the next part, we're going to get more into some of the Fourier analysis of the noise in this BPF reconstruction, because we know this is going to be very informative, um, not just for BPF reconstruction, which isn't exactly used much these days, but the principles and the teaching that we gain from this, the understanding we gain is very significant um, um, for all of inverse problems. So, and also, again, this is very comparable to what's done with filtered back projection reconstruction. So, meanwhile, thank you for listening.